Good morning again. The little stumble of my fingers made me think back to a time when I was in seminary. I had a small church in the foothills of the North Georgia mountains. And for my first funeral uh, ever, mm -hmm. as a new preacher, I wasn't a pastor up there, I was a preacher up there. So as a, a new preacher in their community, and certainly for me, doing my first eulogy and uh, graveside to middle. It was fall, late summer actually, hot, the wind was blowing. I had my notes all ready and set, and I'm standing there, and I had just as here, I had brought from across the street where the church is, up the little hill to where the, the uh, cemetery was, and I had put the put the uh, music stand right beside the grave, and I was giving my best to the family in mourning. About the third word, the wind came along, and every note that I had was in the next county. This morning, we're going to talk about things like courage and calmness and peace and grace and all of those things that, that come to us when we rely on the Lord more and more, less and less. And so when we understand who God is to us, it's much easier to share the gospel message in the way that we live and the things that we say. This morning's message has a foundation of the gospel of, of Mark, the 8th chapter, the 27th through the 38th verses. As you heard in the uh, young people's message, it, it is that one we are very familiar with. When Jesus is polling the people of his surroundings, his disciples and, and the communities around uh, about who they think he is and who the disciples say he is based on who he truly is. And so we again explore this hopefully in a very unique and different way than you've heard in the past, because those questions are so important to your development as a child of God. How you answer and behave as a child of God makes such a difference as you go out these doors into the world, because mostly the world is watching you and hearing what you say so that they understand what it means to be a child of God. So, as Jesus told the people around him, as Jesus told the disciples who loved him, it's very similar to our modern day. Every time we type a word into our computer search engine, every time we swipe our credit card at the grocery store, every time we get on the internet and share with media programs about what's going on and, and and who we are. We are giving information, data, to people who are gathering that. And it's such a sophisticated world of gathering information, so much different than the old neighborhood canvassing and the phone surveys of the past. But Jesus had his own reasoning for his market research. Jesus wanted to understand the development of the people around him. And so he was having his own little polling session, his little marketing research on his own. Let's look at the passage for this morning. The Gospel of Mark, the 8th chapter, the 27th through the 38th verses. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say that I am? And they replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. And he stopped and asked, But what about you? Who do you say that I am? Peter was 
the quasi spokesman for the group so often, he would jump in at a moment's notice and share. Here's what Peter said. You are the Christ. What a statement, what a bold statement that was. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and teachers of the law. And that he must be killed after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. And then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must decide, deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me, I will also be ashamed of them in the times to come. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Jesus really knew his disciples better than they knew themselves. He, he knew what was inside of them, what they were thinking, who they were, how they acted you know, based on those events and the things that were going on in their lives. And so he desired for them to draw from within the answers to those questions. Who do they say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Truth be known, I believe the whole reasoning behind asking them questions he already knew the answers to was to force the disciples to turn and look into what was necessary to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. The desires that they understood and how their lives would then change as they were willing to follow Jesus all the way to Calvary, to the cross. You see, to the crowd, Jesus was kind of a throwback to an earlier age. And perhaps like John the Baptist and Elijah, he was kind of a forerunner to the real Messiah to come. What does that mean to us? It means that they did not understand that Jesus was the Messiah, the anointed one. But it is that common thread that runs through the world that tells them who Christ really was. Remember the qualifications? He had to be a descendant of King David. He was to restore Israel's sovereignty, bring earthly deliverance to the earthly kingdom of Israel. Those things skewed the bias of the people. That they were looking for something that they could understand, something they desired. But God's picture was so much more broad than that. They had been under domination of foreign rulers and oppression by Rome. And when they heard the word Messiah, they thought of someone who would change the way they live, the change the people who would control them into someone that would lead them. What they were really thinking about in modern terms is they were looking for a new president. This is why the crowd saw Jesus more as a prophet than a messiah. Because he wasn't acting like someone that was ready to rumble with Rome. It didn't seem like he was a viable candidate for the term messiah as they understood it. They were looking for someone that would change their lot in life here and now and physically and mentally and emotionally. So let me ask you the question. When you're looking for a Messiah, who is it that you are looking for? It seems that we would look to characteristics 
to answer that question. Well, what is it about this person that I'm looking for that makes a difference in my world and changes my life? It seems like we would find clues in the way that people spoke. And so if we research who Jesus really was and we look at the words that Jesus really said, we might find clues as to who he really was. In that passage, as reported in the gospel, Jesus said, whoever is willing to lose their life for the gospel and for me will gain their life. Wow, think about that. Are you willing to lose your life for Jesus, for the gospel? If you are, you'll save your life. That's a mouthful of words that's hard to understand. How do we do this? How do we, how do we understand that Christ came to the earth physically and emotionally to show humankind God's love, especially to the least and the lost, and he's talking about us giving our life. You know, it's kind of hard to find anybody that's willing to give their life for anything. Much less other people and other situations. Jesus came and preached love and compassion and cast out demons. And what he saw in the people were like sheep without a shepherd to follow in Christ's footsteps we too must feel compassion for other people Amen. because the, the world around us is different than Jesus was but it took more than compassion for Jesus to stand up for us it took a sense of courage a strong sense of courage for Jesus to literally take his cross and die for us. I'm going to tell you a story, and I think as we go through this, you might remember it in the news. It was back in January of 1982, Washington National Airport. It was blizzardly cold. I made that word up. Blizzardly cold. You can kind of imagine the, 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 the strong winds and the snow blow, blowing and and the people of this flight were in the plane for more than an hour sitting there on the, on the tarmac, on the, on the runway. And when the time came for the plane to move forward in line to be the first to take off, no one stopped to think how cold, how much ice, how much snow had built up on the wings. January of 1982, the plane takes off. It struggles and strains as it's leaving the ground to clear the, uh, the bridge over the Potomac River. But it fails in the edge of the, the bottom edge of the plane, hits the bridge, and it dives down into the Potomac River. 72 on board were killed instantly. Seven people struggled and made it to the wing and were standing in the bitter, wet cold of that day on the wing. And one woman panics and she goes, I'm going for the shore. And she dives into the river, but the river is not only extremely cold and filled with ice, it's got a current that takes her and starts running her down the river away from, away from safety. And people on the, side of, on the side of the river watched in fear of what was about to happen. And in those times, it was quiet as, as, as dawn. On a crisp winter morning. Until all of a sudden, here come the ambulances and the sirens of the police cars and the fire trucks. And they get there and they try to find ways to rescue the people who are still alive and still on the plane. The Coast Guard is called and a, a helicopter comes with a a lifeline cable with a, a life ring. Oh, back to the woman in the current. People are watching in dismay. What do we do? And one young man says, we've got to save her. And he jumps in the river. He swims out, grabs her, and pulls her to safety of the shore. They were frozen with fear. 
We've got to act on our compassion with courage. Seven people lived that day. Six of them were still standing on the on the uh, plane's wing that was the only thing above the water of the river. The Coast Guard helicopter comes over, drops that lifeline with a, a ring on the tat attached to the end of it, and there's this one chubby, chubby old man with a bald head and a big mustache. And the first thing that happens, he sees it coming down, he runs over, he grabs it. But not for himself. You see, he had compassion and courage. And he gave it to the next person beside him. And they lifted him up and took him to the shore and came back. Same thing happened again. The little chubby, bald-headed man with, with a mustache grabbed the ring and gave it to another and another and another. Six, five, four, three, two. All were saved but the little chubby man with a bald head and a mustache. And when the Coast Guard helicopter came back to the what was left of the plane, he was gone. They found him later that week. He had drowned in the cold, icy waters of that river. But when they asked who he was, it was not surprising what he did. They asked family and friends. They said he was just that kind of man. He was always giving of himself to others. You see, it takes compassion and courage to follow Jesus all the way to Calvary. But it takes one more thing besides compassion and courage. It takes a calmness of spirit. It comes when we honestly understand deep inside, ultimately we understand God's world. Life conquers death. Love conquers hate. And courage conquers fear. That little man knew those things and follow Jesus all the way to Calvary. Now I'll tell you another story that dates way back, 1932. John and Betty Stam. They don't mean anything to us because most of us don't understand or maybe never heard the story, but they were early missionaries to China from the United States. In about 1900, missionaries in foreign countries were receiving a lot of persecution. There was a lot of violence going on around bringing the love of Christ to foreign countries who believe totally different than we do. But the stands knew that when they accepted that, that appointment as missionaries to China, that they were taking on the dangerous ways of living, surviving. But here's the deal. They would write back to their, their families and their friends and the stations that sent them with letters of great enthusiasm and joy. And they were excited about being able to serve God in a foreign country in a very important role, sharing the gospel. They were willing to follow Jesus all the way to the cross at Calvary. That's who they were. And it was December of 1934 that there was a knock on the door and it was the soldiers who had come to, to uh, take them away. And so they put them in jail, asked for a ransom from the rich country of the United States, who, by the way, does not negotiate with terrorists. And by December of that, by December of that year, their captors realized that there was no ransom coming. So they decided to kill the stands for their offense to their country by sharing about the love of Jesus Christ. 
The soldiers broke into their house, dragged them into the street, stripped them of every ounce of clothing, tied their hands to a rope, tied the rope to the jeep, and drug them through the streets so that people would understand what happens when you love Jesus. When the news hit the United States that they had been killed and tortured, it was Moody Bible Institute that sent them. The only words that they had ever received was about the joy of serving the kingdom. About how important it was to share the gospel no matter what. When they, their colleagues heard of their death, 700 students volunteered to join the mission field. Isn't that the way that God works in our world? And God takes the bad of what's going on in the world, adds the good of loving Jesus Christ, and changes the lives of people that you may not even know. They came to their mission field with calmness and courage, knowing these things. The gospel is true. Jesus will triumph. They may have lost the battle, but Christ had already won the war. And to follow Christ all the way to Calvary, we need compassion, courage, calmness of spirit. And that's what each of us must focus upon to serve the kingdom well. Even in our communities around us. Compassion, courage, and calmness are what it takes to do the work of the kingdom. To share the joy of the gospel. Can you focus that much? And all the children say, Amen. Amen.